But one day, I don't know what it was, you know, I broke, you know, I wore her down. I was probably a very convincing child, as you can imagine. <laughs> and I convinced her to buy me this little plane, and I put, and what you know, the plane broke the same day that I got it. So she probably thought it was, you know, a waste of money, and it was, you know, she, I knew he was going to break that little plane, you know. He, <laughs> I wasted my 10 cents. But, uh, you know, if you think back, you know, I still remember to this day, I remember that day buying that plane and taking it to the, to the park and, and putting it together and, you know, winding it up and playing with the plane until I broke it. And I was probably upset when I broke it, too. Probably tried to fix it. So I thought it was worth the money. I still remember to this day. Also, too, I always remember, because um, I went to a, a Catholic school. You know, we had to wear the Catholic school uniform, little tie, you know, and shirt collar and pants. Uh, for kindergarten, I went to a public school. It was a very bad public school, a very, very dangerous school. As a matter of fact, uh, some guy got arrested and molesting kids and stuff off the street. Because back in those days, people could just walk in off the street and go into a school, <laughs> you know, and just wander around until someone, you know, says, hey, what are you doing here? You know, someone took it upon themselves to kick them out. They didn't have all these rules and lockdowns and stuff like they have now. And uh, at the, the my grammar school, was the same school as uh, that uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Sotomayor went to, uh, Blessed Sacrament in the Bronx. So, but we always, we didn't have a car, so we always had to walk. And I, I remember one of the places that always sticks in my mind that we would walk down along Soundview Avenue uh, between the Soundview Station and the St. Lawrence Station, right under the L train. And it was his boxing gym that was there. And it had a, a like a, a chain link fence that was spray painted black. And even that was all rusted off. And, you know, it was spray painted like 20 years earlier. And it had like a little, you could open up these two gates of this fence. And it was like an archway over it because it was like 10, 15 feet high. And then when they opened it up, you could drive cars in there, you know, and it was right next to the gym was a go-go bar. OK. And I remember the go-go bar was like white. It was painted white, but again, old and, you know, dirty and paint and stuff like that. And it was like a little uh, diamond shaped window in the front of the door that you used to be able to peek into. But then later on, they spray painted that black. And so this was a, a center of attention for us kids, you know, young boys, you know, <laughs> passing by this place. The boxing gym had its allure to us, its attraction. And uh, what we would do is before we got up the nerve to, to really go in there and, and meet the people and talk to them, says, hey, you know, we want to, you know, use the gym. Uh, we would just go in there and run around. We would go in and run through the place, you know, and run around the, the, the ring and maybe the, one of the heavy bags would be there, and we'd punch the heavy bag, and then we'd run out, you know? And uh, until one day, you know, the guys who owned the gym or worked at the gym or whatever, you know, stopped us and says, hey, you know, you can't do this. You can't do, you know, you have to behave yourselves when you come in here. But if you want to come in and you want to use, you know, the bags, we'll teach you how to do it and stuff like that. You know, we'll teach you how to uh, punch the bags. And then later on, they taught us how to tape our hands and stuff. As, you know, years went by and we got to know these people. So this was something that went on, you know, up until like the third grade, until the eighth grade. And, and growing up there, one of the things we noticed was these guys at the gym, these boxers and these guys who were like trainers and managers and stuff like that. And the owner of the gym had respect in the neighborhood. They had respect like uh, like the gang members had respect, you know, and, and it was kind of unusual, too, because you didn't see a lot of people like who wore like shirt collars and, and sport jackets and s dress pants and shoes uh, in, the, in the neighborhood, in this Bronx neighborhood. Like my dad dressed that way. He would wear a suit and tie to go to work as an accountant in Manhattan and get on the train, go to Manhattan, go to work. But most of the people who lived in our building were laborers and stuff like that. But so these guys at the gym who ran the gym and were these trainers and stuff like that were well-dressed guys. They had cars. So even though they were like street guys and they'd be hanging out there drinking beers out in front of the place, and had that kind of reputation. Like, this was like a known spot. Hey, the gym is, you know, those are bad guys. Those are tough guys over there. 
and guys to be respected. But they were also like professional looking guys, like my dad was. So it was something always stuck in my mind, this boxing gym. And then as we got older, we started noticing that the around five, you know, we just, uh, you could stay out later, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night, especially in the summertime when the sun's still out, that uh, the men in the gym, the boxers and these guys would come out and drink beers and stuff like that when the girls, the go-go dancers, would show up to go to work at five, six o'clock at night. And, you know, they would, the girls would walk by and all the men would whistle at them and stuff like that and try and flirt with the girls. The girls would flirt with the guys. And it, that's when we started, too, <laughs> just like we had first started out running into the gym and running around the ring and stuff like that. We would go and run into the, the go-go bar and we would run around the place right? until the, the guys from the gym again told us one day, hey, you're not allowed to do that anymore. It, the gym, too, was another spot, too, where uh, around this time of year, right before 4th of July, because back in the Bronx in those days, they would sell firecrackers and illegal fireworks out of the candy stores. And I had a friend, Johnny Corey, his dad owned a candy store in the Bronx, and he would sell fireworks. But I remember one time, I wanted my family, my, my parents, my mom and dad, was after church, because we used to go to church on Sundays and then walk home, you know, and... uh I wanted to get some fireworks, and I says, hey, I know those guys at the gym. They sell fireworks. We can go over there and buy some. And when my mom and dad took me over there, and then these men at the gym knew me. <laughs> they knew who I was. They knew my name, and I knew them. I can remember, you know, and they were introducing themselves to my dad and stuff like that, my mom. You know, I, I knew my parents were, like, taken aback. Like, you know, what is my kid doing? <laughs> what is he up to? How does my son know these gangsters at this gym? I could only imagine. Plus, it was right next door to the go-go club, which everybody knew existed in this town. I could hear my parents talking about it. Oh, that uh, filthy club over there. <laughs> you know? But we, uh, anyway, let's move on. I can remember it then, like it was yesterday. The smell of this gym, you know, the sweat and the leather and the, the smoke and the, and then right next door, you know, you could smell the booze and the, the girl's perfume and again, the, you know, that, that cigarette smell, you know, this these musty places. Because there was no air conditioning in either one of these places. You know? Back in those days, there was no air conditioning in the school either. And uh, we would go out all day long. It's just amazing. I was thinking about it before. My mom would take us to, to the beach, to Orchard Beach. And we'd have to take a train and two buses. And we'd be on this train and buses like two and a half hours to get over there. Three hours to get to this beach. And so when we would leave in the morning, we would go to the little candy store, the deli, and get a sandwich made and a yoo I'd get a sandwich and a yoo And that's all we had to eat or drink all day long. After riding on this bus and riding on this train to get to the beach and then play in the water and the beach and the sand all day long with one bottle of Yoo-Hoo to drink all day long and then come home at night. And this is a little tiny bottle of Yoo-Hoo. It's not even a big bottle of Yoo-Hoo. It's a small little bottle. You know, nowadays, people, you know, they put you in jail for this. They would, you treat your kids like that. You don't give them any water. You take them to the beach all day and put them on a bus all day. They don't want that a glass of water. You know, now, forget it. You're drinking eight, 10, 15 glasses of water all day long. But the thing is, is we started growing up in this gym and they were training us and they would, they would let us put on the gloves and they'd tape our hands and they'd let us spar with our friends and stuff like that. Uh, and and I, me and my buddies, I was always a little bit bigger, you know, when I had this bigger personality, I was kind of an intimidating kind of guy. And so I could kind of, you know, beat up my friends, you know, I was, like, I was never concerned about, uh, you know, that kind of confrontation with my friends because I knew that I was the alpha dog. I was a top guy, you know, that was good, you know, but at the gym. I would. I assumed that these guys would see my talent, you know. But mo my talent was mostly just like pushing, you know, like and, and pushing my weight on people, you know. And where these other my friends were tall, you know, had, had longer arms and stuff like that. And I, and so the the guys at the gym saw them as potential boxers and had, had they had potential, you know. And it, so they gave them more attention, and they they gave them more time training my friends than they did me. And this went on for a couple of years and I even invite them to come over on Saturdays on the weekends and stuff. They could come down and train for real. Whereas me, that was just kind of treated like, hey, this guy, yeah, go ahead, play, you know, uh, spar with the guys, hit the bag over there. 
And but I remember my friend Georgia especially, and they really saw a lot of talent in this kid. And I said, "Well, but why? I can beat this guy up. I don't understand." So finally, I got up the courage and I, I said to the guy, one one of the guys who was the big guy in charge, and I says, "You know, well, I don't I don't understand. Like, why do you give them all the attention?" And, you know, when you want to train them, and then with me, you know, and I could beat these guys up. I'm, I'm tougher than these guys. And he said to me, he says, you know, yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm a Spanish guy, you know. He says, but look at your hands. You know, you, your hands are small. You know, your fingers are small. And your nose, you know, your nose is thin. You know, you, and your arms aren't long. You, you don't have the physical tools to, to be a, a fighter, to be a boxer, you know? And I thought it was Muhammad Ali. I used to dance around. I would <laughs> jab it. I thought it was Muhammad Ali, you know? But this is not, you just, you just don't have the tools. You know, you weren't born with it. But also, too, you're not going to need this, you know, because you know, you're a smart guy. You can go out. You can do things, you know? Your father's who works in the city. Your father's a, you know, a white-collar guy. You can go to college, you know? Whereas he was right. Distractions were going to come up in my life. I'm not going to live in that gym my whole life. I had ambitions. I was going to get out of there. But where some of the guys I hung out with, that was a something they could hang on to and make something out of, you know? So. But, I, you know, I don't know. As much... You know, he told me, you, you, you'll finish school and you'll get a good job. You don't need this. And as, as much as I understood what he was saying, I was still disappointed. So, you know, growing up in the Bronx, you know, we used to, we didn't have like baseball gloves and baseball bats and stuff like that. So we would buy these little uh, Spalding baseballs and play hit off the curb. It was just like baseball, but instead of swinging a bat, you'd throw the ball against the curb, bounce it off, and then you'd run the bases. We'd make our own go-karts, right, out of milk cartons, milk crates, you know, because they used to deliver the milk in those big wooden crates. It was like a big box, and you'd, you'd nail that down to a two-by-four, and then you'd get a roller skate, a metal roller skate with a skate key. <laughs> you'd take the roller skate apart. There's two wheels in the front, and then there'd be two wheels in the back, and you'd nail that with a hammer, right? Someone would give up their roller skate, <laughs> whether willingly or unwillingly. <laughs> Some kid left the house one day with two skates, you know, and uh, someone else uh, made a go kart out of his. Uh, we went home with the one skate, and then later on, they didn't they didn't make the wooden crates anymore. They made them out of plastic, and then there was a big debate. Well, which one makes the better go kart? You know, the the wooden ones or the plastic ones? You know, some guys like the wooden, some guys like the plastic. Hey, but the thing is, we were outside all day long with no parental supervision whatsoever, no helmets riding our bikes. Are you kidding me? If you wore a helmet, you would have, forget it. You never would have lived it down. Biggest joke in the world. But we were so unsupervised, it was almost like Lord of the Flies. Remember that movie, that black and white movie, Lord of the Flies? You know, it was a great book. You know, it was filmed down in Puerto Rico with these kids with all these English accents. And they, they're shipwrecked on this island. They run around, kill the pig, kill the pig, slit his throat. And they, they turn it to savages. And that's pretty much how things were, you know, because, uh, you know, you, you, a bunch of kids with no supervision. You have this social pecking order uh, and your own justice system. You make up your own rules on the spot and punishments dished out to kids on the spot. And whoever's considered the leader of the pack that day is making all the rules, calling all the shots. And even if. But you could always turn to the older kids, you know, and find the real leaders of the neighborhood, you know, and, and bring them your, your your case and try and get justice from them in case you know, things weren't working out for you, you know, in the, in the smaller group. And in this kind of atmosphere, what happens is you got, since there's no law, there's no uh, authority figures, right, is rumors and myths spring up. You know, I remember... Uh, we used to think that uh, if you ate the, the pits from a watermelon, that a watermelon tree would grow out of your ears <laughs> because the older kids told you this was true. I remember one time they had these we, these weeds, you know, we found these, these uh, in the grass, you know, and they says, oh, yeah, you could take a, all that white stuff that comes out of there and you could put it in a glass and you could drink it. 
<laughs> you know, all this crazy stuff, man. You know, they say, well, you can make a poison out of that and kill somebody. Oh, yeah, one of the kids got killed.